tell us about what made you decide to do this film about mm. your dad. There are two separate reasons. The first reason was um, my friend, Sarah D., who's the producer of the film, said to me after about six months of hearing me talking about what had happened to my father and trying to make sense of what had happened to my father, she said to me, look, you need to make a movie about this and I will produce it. And, um, and suddenly I thought, wow, I could actually have a producer? Okay, maybe I'm, maybe I'm ready to do that. So that was the first reason, and I can't mm, emphasize enough that this project wouldn't exist without Sarah having done that. And then she found Eric um, Wyckoff, who had played Division I football at um, Illinois, who was my age and still trying to make sense of that experience. He's now a cinematographer. And Eric agreed that he would go on the road with us and we would go try to figure this out together. So building that team was the first reason why. I knew I was um, going to be really well cared for. Okay. So the second reason was, um, in all honesty, in the, initially I felt violated by the phone call asking to donate our fa my father's brain. Um, my father had barely been dead when we got the phone call out of the blue from somebody saying, you know, would you like to donate your father's brain um, to understand better the impact of um, concussion in sport? And my father was in professional football for 40 years. And his richest, most important relationships were with the men that he was on teams with. So our feeling was that my father would want that. He would have wanted what was left of his body to go to help the men that he loved. Um, when there was this national press release that Luke Carpenter was number you know, 17 out of 18 former professional athletes, da, 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 I thought that was not our intention with this. Why are we being used to forward someone else's agenda? And does this thing really even exist? So my initial impetus actually was to go find out for myself what was true and how this information was either being used or manipulated by people for their own gain. And that's the truth of why I did it. Honest. <laughs> well, As you're working now yeah. with the film and what you have found, yeah. what do you think the main message is going to be for, particularly for young people who, right. uh, who are involved in right. football, who view the film? I think for young people, the message is um, have your own mind. Think for yourself. That's really hard to do. It may be the hardest thing that any of us ever do, especially those of us who come from traditionally low-income, rural, urban contexts where Nobody's really that interested in what we have to say. So we don't even pay attention to what we think sometimes. So I think really learning to think for yourself and say, is this coach asking me to do something that makes sense to me? Um, you know, and then secondly, I think that, um, if I can just veer off a little bit, I think the bigger message for me will be to the parents and to those coaches. Is this six-year-old boy an extension of some need of yours? Or are you really having his best interests in mind when you ask him to do something on the football field? Just one. That's one. Uh, when you were watching your father play, uh -huh. did you watch your father play? Never. You, never. you never did? I was born the year after he retired. Okay. Uh, have you seen films of him? Yeah. Okay. So you've watched films of him playing. Uh, do you sometimes have to look away when he, uh, when there are impact situations, or, or you just uh, think that that's part of the game, or has that ever really mat mattered to you that much? <laughs> I'm a mom, and um, and I think the the thing that you need to know about my relationship with my father is that he was crazy about my dad. I mean, I'm so much like him. I'm absolutely. I'm absolutely crazy about my father. He's been dead almost three years, and I'm telling you, he is with me right now. When I see him, this is going to sound weird, but here you go. Um, 
when I see him getting tackled like that, my instinct is to reach down and try to hold him and comfort him and tell him like it's okay to take care of himself. Like, you know, you got hit really hard, how are you? <laughs> That's actually my instinct. Um, what's harder for me now is to watch men who are bigger, faster, stronger, and anesthetized in advance of getting hit, hit each other. Because I understand that the, the impact is so much greater than even the, my, that's different. That's like a, tra that's watching, like watching a train collision. That's painful for me with my father. You know, they were having good fun. I mean, it was high stakes and, but he always knew it was a game. I don't know, I, I feel like I'm not being very articulate, no, but that's fine. yeah. yeah. Um, I, um, when you said uh, yeah. that these players are anesthetized, what uh -huh. do you mean by that? When is hitting? Because well, if they're because taking drugs like Adderall, oh, okay. um, that's creating a heightened focus, for instance, their pain receptors are not what they're tuned into. Their, their goal is what they're tuned into. Um, I'm a highly focused person. I can tune out anything. You know, I have two herniated discs. I have massive torn um, soft tissue in my back from a rowing accident. You know, and I kept rowing on that torn up back for six weeks. I stopped when I couldn't stand up anymore. I really do understand paying through play pain. I really do understand playing through pain. It's part of my own ethos. And the last thing that I, that I want to make sure I say in, in association with this project is, you know, my father came from a time and place where a person of his economic circumstance was very much living on the margins. He had young parents who came from very fragile mm, families. Um, violence was a typical way of disciplining your children or keeping your children in line. In some ways I understand now those parents are also were trying to keep their children safe by understanding like if you get out of line you think this is bad you know, wait till the man, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I understand that for him, nobody was cultivating his mind at that time. They saw he was a big, brawny, agile, gorgeous athlete, and they invested in that aspect of him. So that's the part of him that grew. Okay. And he put his considerable brain into that and was an amazing tactician and technician as a coach. I wonder, if somebody had seen his extraordinary intellectual gifts at age nine or 10, how different his life might have looked. But, but secondly, he broke a cycle of poverty and abuse that it's terribly difficult to break out of. Anybody who understands the literature on intergenerational poverty and how hard it is to get out of it understands that somebody who does that has performed nothing short of a miracle. He understood that he did that with the help of his teammates, his coaches, fans, communities. He didn't do it alone, but he got me out of that. And he gave me my own mind. That was what he wanted for me. I was able to go to an Ivy League college. I have two master's degrees. That was my father's gift to me. And out of love for him, I have an obligation now to tell you about what happened to the men that he loved. Great.